Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair, and this time we have an instrument we've never had in the lab before. This is the Rodenshorst SMB100A, and this is a vector signal generator. And this particular model goes up to 3.2 GHz, but you can get these guys all the way up to 6 GHz, with I think modulations of about 120 MHz, which makes them fairly attractive, especially for low band 5G work. And this particular one has also INQ uh, inputs at the front, so you can modulate from an external source. Unfortunately, they're not differential, but nonetheless, we're going to try that out. So something's wrong with this unit, and we're going to have to do some testing to figure out what's going on. Now, it takes a bit of time for it to boot, but let's go ahead and hook it up to another instrument and see if we can find out what's wrong with it. So here the instrument has booted, and it has the classic signal flow diagram GUI that Roden Shorts has in all of their instruments. It's fantastic. I think it's one of the best ways, really an engineering way of displaying how a signal is processed and manipulated. And in every step of the way, you can then go ahead and adjust various settings uh, of the instrument. So we're not going to make any um, you know, adjustments or anything like that. We're not going to do any modulation. We just want to see a tone out of the unit. So right now it's set to 1 gigahertz at 0 dBm, and the output is turned off. I can enable and disable the output like this. So let's hook it up and see what comes out. So I've gone ahead and connected the output of the vector modulator directly to the input of the ZNL6. I've also done an extensive review of the ZNLE. This is, of course, the higher model, and it has a lot of new features, including a real-time spectrum analyzer. It's a really nice hybrid instrument. We'll do a review of that in a different video. So let's go ahead and enable the output here. So I'm at 1 gigahertz and 0 dBm, and here's the RF output. And take a look. Yep, that looks nice. This is a 1 gigahertz tone. Unfortunately, the amplitude is completely wrong. It's at minus 26 dBm. It should be at zero. There is some loss in the cable, but it's really not that significant. We can go ahead and adjust the actual power because this instrument should have a really wide dynamic range. So let's increase the output to 10 dBm and let's see what happens. There it is. Here's 10 dBm. And check it out, I, we went to minus uh, 16 almost. So indeed, we increased by 10 dBm. So that increase was correct. And this tells me that um, some of the functionality is definitely there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do this. Let's go down by 10 dB. Let's go to minus 10 dBm. And check it out, it went, out, it went down by exactly 10 dB. So everything seems to be working. Let's go to minus 20. There it is, now there's minus 46, yeah, it's very precise. So indeed, uh, its problem is not from the attenuators, or at least it doesn't look like it. So this now becomes quite a bit more interesting. Let's go then to, let's say, back to zero. Yeah, there it is, it went back to minus 26. Now what I can do is I can also change the frequency and see how it behaves across frequency. So here it is at uh, 1 gigahertz. Let's increase. Let's say go to 2 gigahertz. And, ah, look at that. Interesting. The output changed by quite a bit. Now it's at minus 19 dBm. So it increased. Let's keep going. 3 gigahertz. Yes, it increased again. This is really unusual. Let's go back down. Let's go below. Let's go to 500 megahertz. Let's see if it keeps going down. And check it out. Yep, it did. It went to minus 32. So in fact, it has a very interesting frequency response. So let me put the permanent trace there and see what it looks like. So here's a trace on max hold. Let's go to, here's 100 megahertz. Let's increase that and check it out. Very interesting. Now I have some ideas of why this is happening. So here's the maximum frequency. You can see that it's going up and then it kind of flattens out a little bit. Unfortunately, we can't go anymore, but I suspect it would keep going up. Uh, this, at this point, you're also fighting the cable loss, so the slope of it is not quite clear. So why is that happening? I think in order to understand this, we're going to have to take the unit apart and take a close look at it. But before we do that, let's take a look and see if there's anything in the service manual in terms of block diagram so we can get a, an understanding of the unit's operation. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, which is quite important, is that the instrument reports absolutely no errors at all. It doesn't say it's on level. It doesn't say there's any problem with the RF path. I ran a self-test and everything passed. So the instrument is not even aware that the signal is not present. That actually is a good sign, believe it or not. That's the best case scenario because it means that the fault is essentially almost at the output of the board because otherwise the instrument would know the ALC loop would be active, the power leveling would be active, which means that it can do all of that and it still doesn't work. So that gives us a, quite a bit of more hint on where to look for the problem. So here's the block diagram that's provided in the service manual. It's not really detailed, not like the 
key side block diagrams typically are but nonetheless the service manual still goes through a lot of different test points you can check for voltages and so on they still could be quite useful in case of let's say a power supply failure if you want to know if a particular module has failed of course here we want to do component level not module level repair so we have four main boards we have the rf board that's what's connected to the output so that's the main cable going out you can see this board does support up to six gigahertz even though this instrument is only related to 3.2 with the licenses that it has and then there is the baseband digital board. This board ha is going to have the DAC on it, it's going to have all the memory on it, and all the algorithms to create a various waveforms is going to sit on this. And then there is the vector board which takes that signal and then creates the modulation. You can see that there is a modulation output as well as an LO output. And both of those can then uh, go into the RF board and out. And then you also have various other pulse and other kind of drivers going in which can then mix with this. So there's some functionality in here as well. All of the attenuators, amplification, various uh, leveling and so on is all done in this board. And given our test and what we are seeing, this is the board we should really be focusing our attention. We're not even testing these yet because we're not doing any modulation. And then there is the main board which has uh, everything else on it. Not that exciting, which then interfaces to the front panel. Power supply and hard drive are also there. So we kind of have a rough idea of what's going on and you can see the synthesizers on here. We're not having, we don't have a synthesizer problem, otherwise we will be able to cash in the self-test. But overall I think it's fairly straightforward. So now we can go ahead and take this apart and take a detailed look and see how it's made inside. And here is the top of the unit with the cover off and we can already identify the different boards that are in here based on the block diagram we saw. So here's the baseband section. You can see there is a custom Rodenschwarz IC here, DSP from TI. Some blocks could be FPGAs of some kind, memory, almost certainly the ARP storage memory. DC-DC converters uh, interconnect to the main bus and between the boards of course. This shielded area over here is um, almost the certainly the analog portion of the baseband generator and you can see couples onto the main modulator board here. This discoloration you see on the surface of the metal is normal. This is a, the, just a surface reacting. It doesn't really matter. This is a fairly thick piece of metal. It has nothing to do with the inside of the chassis there. So yeah, looks good. I think we should flip it to the other side. None of these boards are a problem and even if they are a problem we haven't even tested them because the problem is from the output. So we have to look to the other side. So I decided to take two steps at one. Uh, and then actually remove the top cover as well as remove the shield. So here we go. And this is really beautifully designed. I mean, look at this. These screws don't actually come out. So they're they're trapped. So basically you can unscrew them, but they won't fall out. It's fantastic. This is the first time I've seen so many of these screws behave this way. Here we go. You can see they're all there. And here's the main board. It looks nice. Now looking at it very quickly right now. Uh, let's see. Where is the output? Ah, here it is. Here's the output portion right here at the bottom. So it looks like most of the stuff is on the other side. I don't see the crystal, I don't see the VCO, I don't see most of the RF filters and switches. There's a lattice here, uh, CPLD most likely, it's a glue logic of some sort. Everything down here looks analog, doesn't really look RF. So it means it must all be on the other side. So I think we can take this out. I started taking these connectors off and I marked them so I don't forget the order. We're going to have to unscrew these in order to take this board out and take a look at it. But I think it's worthwhile to take this out of the instrument completely and see if we can do some basic reverse engineering just so we can understand it and focus at the output where we think the problem is. And here is this beautiful RF board here. And now we can see most of the RF section because it was on the wrong side. So let's see here. Here's the output at the very bottom and everything else before it is going to be the things you expect, the amplifiers, the step attenuators, and those sections appear to be working. So we have the input over here, or I should say the output, coming over here. There is a component here which I don't completely recognize yet, but if I were to guess, I would say it might be a relay. The reason I think that is because the output includes the reverse power protection. And one of the ways to do reverse power protection is to completely disconnect the instrument from the RF port. And I, that's probably done here. We will have to take a close look at it here. We have two custom ICs here, which are the amplifier portion. And these are probably active when you want to go at very high powers, let's say 10, 15, 20 dBm two switch ICs over here, so that means that the signal coming in can either just go directly if it doesn't need to be amplified, or goes through these two amplifiers and then comes back. So this section is certainly the amplifier section, and again, these are working, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get the range in output power that we observed, even though the absolute value was wrong. 
and then we have lots of switches here so this is our solid state attenuator you can see different attenuation sections uh, accomplished with a series of resistor dividers and maintaining 50 ohm characteristic impedance of course so the signal coming over here can split it can go straight, it can divide, and so on and on, and that's how you, by switching these in different portions, you can get the attenuations you're looking for. Got a filter over here, uh, some more amplifying sections, and then that should be the output portion. There's some filters here on the PCB uh, for the LO input, I believe, to clean it all up. Uh, here's our main 200 megahertz and temperature compensated crystal oscillator over here. This is the main part of the synthesizer's clock reference. And this is supposed to be going into a DDS. It's interesting that for low frequency outputs, this instrument accomplishes that using a DDS, a direct digital synthesis followed by a DAC, which is interesting. And then for higher frequencies, it uses that as a reference and mixes it up with itself at the 200 megahertz here to go to higher frequency and then mixes that with, uh, it puts that as a reference into the PLL. So the, here is a VCO here. This is a custom road and shorts part. And you can see the output of that goes over here. There's a very interesting structure here, and this appears to be a single entity differential conversion, a, a cool coupler design. Uh, this chip is an Atmel. I don't recognize it. I've never seen this one before. It's an unusual IC. I couldn't find a data sheet for it. Uh, and then we have a Xilinx uh, you know, FPGA over here, nothing unusual, some DACs over here. But the entire PLL section is in how encased over here. So that takes care of that. Now, again, the reason I'm not going into so much detail is because, well, this stuff is already working. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting the correct frequency. We would be getting some errors. So the combination of the VCO, the TCXO, the PLL, the filters, uh, all of that works. The DDS, that works. So we're going to have to bring our attention to the output. So let me uh, explain again why I think that. Let's say, for example, that the signal is not making it here. Or let's just say that this switch is dead, and the signal is just not going through it, and it's getting attenuated heavily. Well, this would be detectable by the instrument, because there is an ALC that does leveling of the signal. And that might be happening around this region over here. And that should be known to the instrument. That's how it knows where the power level is and to make sure that it is flat. Uh, so yeah, that the reason I think it's from the output portion is because uh, once it goes through this section, once it goes through the reverse power protection, you don't even you don't monitor it anymore. It's uh, basically outside of any of the loops of this board. That's why I want to look over here. Uh, we could do a couple of things. We could uh, solder some cables over here and, and observe it. And I'm trying to see if I can run this board while it's in the instrument, but not covered. There's a couple of things. First of all, it's upside down. This is the area we need to look at. So that's, we, we're not, we can't access it when it's in there. Uh, this is the only interface at the top uh, in order for it to be power. Everything else is just SMA, which we can basically uh, route to it. Now, this section over here has a lot of voltage regulators on it. And this section can get pretty hot. It's actually connected to the metal cover. And that's how the heat is dissipated. So this might be a little bit dangerous to run it without that. It may overheat. So there's a couple of things to worry about. But let me see if I can run this while it's inside the unit, because it would help debugging it quite a bit. Now, Pooch, of course, is having a good time because we've been home for so long because of the coronavirus. So he gets a lot of attention, and he gets to play with us. Aren't you, Pooch? Good Pooch. Okay, so here's a close-up of the output. So the signal comes right over here. This is now the completely amplitude controlled signal. Uh, there is a section here. This could be our ALC detector, not sure. But if you look carefully, you see one, two tiny components there. These are diodes, a very fast Schottky diodes, most likely RF components to detect the power here. So if the power coming back in here from something else is uh, very high, let's say you know 36, 37 dBm, way above what it should be, then these guys will detect that and trigger over here, and then the instrument will disconnect the output to prevent the damage. That means that this TPM YD-16A is almost certainly a relay, a mechanical relay, like a read switch. Uh, so that's, of course, RF, and it has to work at least up to 6 gigahertz in these instruments. So now if you look carefully, you can see one device over here, and then you can see there's some signal going over there connected to this pin. So this is most likely a transistor to switch this. I'm not sure what this is. I have to read the marking. Uh, but this obviously needs power as well. So this looks to me, this entire section, is the reverse power protection in combination with this. And that's what switches this. There are also some components on the other side, which may be, let's say, most likely some competitors, some fast op amps, in order to uh, feed this back into this, to so be able to switch it when the power is too high. So all of this is now fairly interesting. So let's go ahead and take a look at the 
uh, data sheet of a couple of these parts to make sure we understand them and then see if we can run them and just measure this and we should be able to measure this portion for example if there is signal here but there's no signal here then obviously something is broken here now there's one other thing to to consider this guy when the instrument is off is open which means that this is a normally open relay and that makes sense because if the instrument is not on you still want to protect the output so you basically disconnect it completely when it's not on when you enable the output then this guy switches that means that if this stuff is broken this switch may never be activating and that to me right now is the most likely case the other possibility is, which would be unfortunate, is if this actually has experienced a reverse power and these diodes are burnt out uh, or something is completely dead here, meaning that it just never turn, turns this on because it thinks that it is always in reverse power protection mode. I doubt that because the instrument would almost certainly warn us that the, the instrument is receiving too much power. It will tell us and it's not saying anything. So anyway, there's some hope still. Uh, I think we should take a look at the data sheet here and maybe even look at the these two diodes under the microscope because they're tiny and they're in a transparent case. It should look pretty interesting uh, to see how they're made. And here is our diode, as you can see. There it is. Let me get rid of this. Yeah, this is really, really small. So I, I can put some dimensions around here so you can get an idea. So this writing over here is only 0.2 millimeter, this entire part number here. So it looks like that this is a junction. So here's one of the diodes. You can see one side, this is the RF path at the top, and this is onto the detector side. And then if I go to the other one, if I can find it, the other one along the chain should be in the opposite direction. There it is. Yeah, you can see that it is indeed mounted in the opposite polarity because you want to be able to catch both the high and the low signals of course yeah so they were definitely part of the uh, reverse power protection section okay i think i found all the components so here is the relay at the output the 1d-16a this is a read style relay high frequency of course and it's not solid state obviously and this thing works all the way up to 13 gigahertz and so it's way way beyond the operation frequency of the instrument because you can't really correct for this so this really has to be essentially transparent of course they calibrate but this you don't want this to have any effect on the rf power its impedance is going to be 50 ohm that's not surprising and it says it has a reliability of 300 million operations that's that's a lot of course every time you enable and disable the output of this unit this relay is going to go on and off so it's going to have a many actuation over the age of the instrument but 300 million is still very, very high. So I doubt that this is a problem, but we're going to check anyway. So let's see what else we can find here. It's supposed to run from five volts. Okay, good. It's supposed to have an 80 ohm coil resistance. We can check for that to make sure it's present. Let's see what else. I'm looking for its package. Here we go. This is a package the way it sits on the PCB. Ah, here it is. This is the schematic, equivalent schematic. So you can see that pin one and pin nine are across the coil. So if you energize those, then the relay is going to close. And between 3 and 7 is the RF path. And if you note, 2, 4, 6, 8, 5, and this one up here are all ground. This is so you can have a coaxial behavior. It starts with a coplanar waveguide between pin 2 and 4, and it most likely becomes a coax on the inside and back into coplanar. So this has to be very carefully designed, of course. So that's the relay. We're going to check that. There's also two devices. There's this device over here. It's a dual... Uh, uh, diodes there so we have to take a look and make sure that's okay that seems to be sitting on the power supply that's what connects this to the main power supply and then there is a transistor unsurprisingly this is a high side transistor this is a p channel one so it's most likely sitting above the relay and it connects and disconnects the relay uh, from a 5 volt supply so we should be able to check this to also make sure uh, that this is okay if this is dead for instance you cannot turn that relay on and therefore the output cannot be enabled okay i think i did what i wanted to do here so here we have the main board now it's sitting at the bottom i have connected the the power here that's everything comes through here and then i have connected all the other connectors uh, the sma connectors for the rf signals back onto the instrument with some extenders and some adapters and there's a fan hanging just on top over here just and i connected that to a power supply just so i can blow some cold air over those voltage regulators when i power the instrument on and this is a section we want to focus on so i think we can put a multimeter here measure the coil resistance as i just spoke about make sure that that stuff's actually working and then we can power the whole thing on and do some RF measurements. Okay, let's start with the coil resistance here. And hopefully you can read this. Uh, let's see. I think that's from here to here. What do we have? Let's see. This is a very slow meter. There you go. 80 ohms. I think that's correct. Yes. 
I remember that being correct. So the coil is there and the resistance measures correctly. That's already a very good sign, uh, which means that, you know, that hopefully this thing works unless the RF contacts are broken and this thing switches on and off and we just can't see it. In order to see that, we're going to turn the unit on and turn the output on and off and measure to see if voltage is actually applied to the relay or not. So I discovered a couple of things while I was poking around here. So it turns out that I don't think this output relay actually switches on and off with the output being enabled and disabled. It looks like it does that through all the other circuitry. And this is only responsible for the reverse power uh, protection. Uh, for example, I, am, I have my MOSFET right over here, and I can measure the voltage and the gate of that MOSFET and to see if it's turned on. And right now, even though the output is disabled, if I measure that, you can see that that gate is being pulled down, minus 10 volts. So indeed, that should be on. But if I go and measure the input to the relay itself, I see zero. So I think that we're onto something here because I see no voltage across the relay and that should be on right now because the output, I can go ahead and enable the output. I have everything connected, of course, you can see right up there. Let me go ahead and enable the output. And if I can find the button, where did the button go? There it is, so there it is. The output is enabled again. So we can go back down here. We can do that measurement and I can look at the input uh, gate of the MOSFET again. There we go. You can see it's still at minus 10 volts, so that indeed is still doing the same thing. But if I go to the input of the relay, it's still at zero. So yeah, the relay is actually not switching. So that tells us something uh, really interesting about that. I actually had forgotten to turn the fan on. So this whole time this was here and it wasn't doing anything. So yeah, okay, so which means that we have to now go ahead and take a look at that MOSFET and maybe just replace it. It's just a really simple P-channel device and see if that helps. Okay, so I went ahead and I replaced the transistor. I couldn't find one exactly the same as that one, but it was close enough based on the measurements that I made. And uh, they actually measured open on all ports, which was a little bit strange, but let's go ahead and see what happens. So the instrument is back on again, but the output is not enabled. Uh, as you can see over here, there's nothing. So let's go and measure that MOSFET node again. Let me see, just to make sure I didn't destroy anything. So here's that MOSFET node. It used to be minus 10 volts. And yep, it's still minus 10 volts. Excellent. Now let's look at the relay. Yes, 4.4 volts. Beautiful. That used to be zero. So it's doing something. That's, that's perfect. So this relay now, technically speaking, should be on. So now here's the moment of truth. Do we see roughly the correct amplitude. Let me see. Here we go. Where's the output? And yes, look at that. That is beautiful. Okay, let me reposition the camera so we can take a closer look. Let's do the same sweep test again. Uh, we go under trace, trace configuration. We change that to max hold. We go back and let's increase the frequency now. Look at that, that is beautiful. Look at it, it works. It's really nice. Let me keep going. It should go all the way to the end without any problems. You remember how it used to be, used to have a curve like that, of course, and that makes sense because the relay was open and the capacitance of the relay was basically reducing the series resistance across frequency, so you were getting more power out. Uh, that's normal. That's what happens when you AC couple something. Look at that. It works. These are all the second harmonics, of course, as I swept through it, and or the third harmonic. It's beautiful. So I think now the next thing to do is uh, close it back up and let's see uh, if it does everything else correctly. By the way, this Hitachi tool has been an absolute blessing. Honestly, so many screws with this thing, especially having torque limit, it just makes things uh, so much easier to, to close these guys. I just go over them and it, the torque limit basically puts exactly the amount of torque that needs to be there. It makes the job so much faster. I'll put a link in there in Amazon because I think the original one listing is gone. So in case you want to pick one up, I've, I've certainly been very happy with it. So there's really a lot you can do with this instrument. So just to make sure that the arbitrary function generator, the DAC, the modulator, all those functions are working, here I'm just going to create some really basic um, multi-tone signal. So we can do that using a multi-carrier, for example. So here we go. Under multi-carrier, we can say let's do 1 megahertz apart. Let's do 5. Actually, I can change that. You know, Let's do 10 of them. There you go. 10 carriers, uh, 1 megahertz apart. And that's going to create a, a file, and we can load that file into the instrument. It's going to take a little bit of time to compute this. There's a, quite a bit of stuff it does, and you can do crest factor correction. There's a lot of things you can do. It's obviously intended for wireless communication characterization, fairly advanced unit. There you go. I think it's made that. 
Okay, let's go and enable this. So here's the main carrier right now sitting at 2 gigahertz. I'm going to enable all the other carriers and then you will see there it is. Look at that. Looks nice. So you have all our 10 carriers. You can see there's some intermodulation products, of course, that's going to be from the nonlinearity of the system. And there's the, there's the actual main carrier at 2 gigahertz. Some of that can be corrected if you run the calibration routine of the instrument, which I should definitely run, especially since I opened it and put it back together. But, you know, if you can generate this, at, I would say most of the instrument is definitely working. So I think that the fundamental problem of it has been repaired, which is fantastic, because now it can be put back into use. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, it's because of my Patreon supporters that these are possible. I'm really grateful. Take a look at the page. I'm going to update it so hopefully soon and add some more incentives. There's going to be a giveaway. I have a couple of scopes to give away. I have a special video for that coming up in the future. Yeah, I think this was a great uh, little repair here. Sometimes you get lucky and the problem is simple. Sometimes the problem is really complicated. I have a bunch of other repairs as well and a couple of reviews. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you in the comment section.